Welcome to the Weekly Pistol Podcast. At the end of this hour, we want you better than when we started. All right, what's good? What's good, Mark? Hey, we're back. What's up, brother? We're good, man. You're looking good today. You're wearing specific colors for a reason? Yeah, I tried to uh, put on my version of a Canadian tuxedo. Everything in blue jeans. <laughs> for the, for or the denim, guests. Or blue. For the guests today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so um, for those of you guys watching, uh, we're back again, Pistol Podcast. My name's Manny. I'm Mark. And we got uh, two special guests in the studio today, and they're coming from thousands of miles away, right? Not just a Correct. couple hundred miles away, uh, from the wonderful country of Kenyatta, right? Is that how you say it? Canada. Oh, Canada. <laughs> you guys got weird accents. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> this guy shows up in a fucking Lexus, and he's got an Arizona plate, and then right next to him, he's got the fucking... Uh, the Canadian, Canada, flag. The Canadian flag shit right <laughs> with, the, the, with the blue line through it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's nice. I've right. never seen that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a killer hat you're wearing too, by the way. Yeah, it's got same, the same, same as the hat. That's yeah. awesome. So um, Michael and Julie are the guests today, and I appreciate you guys coming out. And we also have the most important guest who's uh, seated just off to your right there, Mina, right? No, she's, uh, she's under the table we're, now. We're, yeah, just like six. Now, before and, this gets any worse, uh, it's a dog. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It's a service dog. It's not so. his second wife a, wow. <laughs> or his first wife, you whatever. Keep, man, you had to keep doing it. I was trying so, to clean it up in a, a little bit. So, um, <laughs> But we appreciate you guys coming out. We're going to talk to them. Uh, Mike has uh, 33 years in, in law enforcement, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, Yes, that's what Michael has, 33 years. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll touch base on that. So just real quick, I'll, I'll have you introduce yourself and your lovely wife here. Um, tell us a little about where you came from and why you're here. I'm uh, Michael Fleming. I'm from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, Move in. Move in a little. Oh, I'm already Move. being told what to do. Yeah. Hey? You're married. <laughs> so this yep. is going to be like real life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've worked for the city of Hamilton up in Ontario, which is about an hour north of Buffalo over the border. Okay. And Buffalo. You're almost an American. Almost an American. Right. Yeah, pretty close. And uh, I was there uh, with them for 33 years, and uh, I retired uh, just over a year and a half ago. And uh, I look over for the numbers because I don't remember numbers and dates very None well. Of us do. Julie's my, she's locked in on that stuff. So. Actually, two years ago. There you go. See, two years ago, yeah, I stand corrected yeah. for the first or second time. Second I time stand already. corrected a lot. Yeah, and I don't mind. You know, <laughs> she's my memory because I don't have one. And uh, I was with Hamilton. Uh, um, for 33 years and uh, worked uh, worked in a lot of jobs within the department. I was very fortunate. I had a good career. Um, I did uh, about 17 years on patrol in all the divisions, um, various stations. I also was able to do some specialty jobs. I worked uh, marine rescue for uh, a while with the department because we're right on Lake Ontario. And uh, I enjoyed that uh, for its stint. And uh, I also did, uh, I guess, what you guys would call street crime. We had a heat unit that uh, was a specialized unit for dealing with specific problems that happened within a division. So uh, I did that for a while. And um, I was also fortunate near the end of my career to work uh, with the intelligence section uh, as uh, one of the officers that helped create our fugitive apprehension unit. And... uh, which for most of us in law enforcement, uh, that's the best job in the world. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, being able to search out. We did all the high-risk, uh, <clears throat> violent and uh, high-risk offenders and people who were wanted. And we traveled across Canada, you know, picking them off. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was that's a pretty good That's just releasing gig. the dogs right there, man. That's, yeah. a, good, yeah. that's a good gig. Yeah. yeah. That was so good. Um, 33 years. How long have you guys been married? We've been together 11 years and married <laughs> Three. Three. You should have totally <laughs> let him answer that. Yeah, Just let that's him okay. Bury I ha- I actually, I usually have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, they, they get con- we get confused. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, during that time now, uh, when you first came to Pistol, I was quite confused because we have cities and states and you have cities and provinces. provinces. Right. So what province are you from? We're from the province of Ontario. Okay. That's the state. That's Yeah, that would be like state. the state. Okay. And uh, Ontario... Um, it's the highly, the most highly populated province in Canada, and uh, we're pretty well center east. And anyone from the western provinces of Canada will call us east. Okay. And 
and uh, and then we also have you know Quebec and Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. They're all on the east coast and uh, nice. that way. So in the gang world, you'd be evil side, the evil side. We'd be the evil yeah, side, not yeah. the west side, the evil side. Yeah, we'd be the evil so, side. So um, Hamilton is the city. Yeah, it's a city. Uh, it's almost six hundred thousand people now. Um, our department, uh, when I was working, was uh, about a thousand sworn officers. Big department, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had uh, four divisions, and yeah, it was uh, a blue collar city for many years. Uh, you know, we used to joke it was Pittsburgh North. When you think when you think <laughs> of uh, yeah. more of the Pittsburgh from days gone by, as opposed right. to Pittsburgh now, yeah. um, it was a steel. It's a steel town, and uh, you know, a lot of blue collar. How, how was the crime? The crime, uh, I, everything that I see in here, uh, here in Phoenix, except maybe on a smaller scale. Okay. But we have gun crime. We have gang crime. Um, you know, of course, all the typical things with human nature, domestics and all that stuff. Fuck, and then domestic when you're in, trapped in the house when it's snowing and shit, like beating the <laughs> shit out of somebody. Hey, you got to get out of the fucking cabin, cabin fever, fever, man. You're like, get me out what, of here. This what's is- the population of that city? Uh, we're Roughly. just... just just under six hundred thousand now. Oh, yeah. So it's a little bit bigger than Mesa. Yeah? So yeah. yeah, and then you got suburbs to that. Yeah, too. it's similar. Right. It's similar in uh, here when you talk about you know Gilbert and Chandler and Mesa, they're all connected, right? So yeah, from yeah. A, from a law enforcement, like we always talk about, right? Bad guys don't have borders. No. So uh, you know where we are, um, we're right next to the Niagara region, which goes all the way down to the border. And then when you start going the other way towards Toronto, you know, we have Mississauga and Oakville, and these are highly populated places. And you Are know, you guys bordered right on those, right next to them? Yeah, like literally you from one to the other, right? Just like yeah. you're in the sub in the valley, yeah. everything's Yeah, you can cross the street and be in the other town. And, uh, gotcha. You know, and of course, depending on what area you're talking about, you know, some so of them. So you said, you said you did patrol for 17 years. Yeah. Now, in the States here, that's a fucking long time to be in patrol. Yeah. Is your patrol section, is, is that descri- like ours? Like you're just, call, you're on radio call nonstop? Yeah, radio yeah it's call, emergen- call? emergency response. It's, you know, you're on radio calls and, uh, and uh, you know, and then within the patrol um, divisions, there are um, our DSOs, our divisional safety officers, which are the guys on the motorcycles. And uh, outside of the patrol divisions, there's all kinds of, of course, specialty units. And uh, like you guys have, we, you know, we have homicide and child uh, sex crimes and uh, child abuse. And but those are those are de- like detective bureaus, right? Detective, They're outside of detective control. bureaus, okay. right? And uh, divi- um, outside the divisional safety, we have the traffic office, which does all the failed to remain uh, investigations and. They're sort of, uh, well, they are detectives as far as I'm concerned. They just happen to be in uniform because they're at traffic scenes a lot. So. Oh, okay. Like a recon. Yeah. Doing recons yeah. and stuff. So, um, how how would, would you say, like, let's just go those 17 years real like, just skim over them. Like, did you have a lot of critical incidents along the way? Because your PTSD is cumulative. Yeah. So, can you kind of, you know, I don't want to say like a, maybe like a day in the life of somebody in patrol in, in your city. Is that, is it like call to call? Is it a lot of hot calls, a lot of e-calls? Is it more, um, cause you had said it was more like a uh, white collar. Um, no, blue collar. Or blue collar. I'm sorry. Um, did you, did you respond to a lot of fatals? What, what was that cumulative in 17 years? How did that, how did that unfold? Or can you kind of explain that? Um, no problem. Uh, I worked, for a lot of my career, I worked uh, Division One, which is basically our downtown core uh, of our city, and it was a it was a high volume calls for service. Uh, early in my career in the eighties, we wait, were. Wait, did you say eighties? Eighties. Holy shit! Yeah, eighties. Man, yeah. did almost thirty years, bro. <laughs> 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 All right, go ahead. Yeah, the downtown core was pretty busy, and uh, we had a lot going on. There was. Uh, it was a huge uh, entertainment uh, bar scene down there, and so uh, you know the population increased uh, on the weekends, yeah. and uh, so we had a lot of calls for service in that regard. Um, not far from the downtown core was a, uh, I guess you'd call the uh, socially economically deprived uh, neighborhoods where we get a lot of calls for service for domestics, for violence, neighbor problems, and uh, you know I remember it being in that first five six years of my career it was a. Uh, steady pace yeah. and uh 
you know, it, it was it was always, you know, back when we did paper reports, you're always sticking a report in the visor oh, and, yeah. and going it's your file out. Cabinet, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, finish the paper later and and clear and go to the next call, and next call, and so that uh, that was quite often it happened. And so subsequently, the calls uh, for service would be uh, everything and anything, uh, a lot of uh, violence. Um, you know, the cumul- cumulative uh, part of my uh, PTSD or the the diagnosis uh, when I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2001, um, I had to uh, had to of course put together all the paperwork uh, with the help of uh, my psychologist uh, in regards to uh, um, a report for Workman's Comp. We call it WSIB, Workman's Safety and Insurance Board, but it's Workman's Comp. And uh, so we documented uh, 11. Uh, very serious traumatic events that uh, occurred to me uh, throughout uh, my career. And, uh, you know, I had uh, coworkers that refu- ref- referred to me as uh, more often than not having a black cloud if I was going to, if there was going to be a horrific shitty call. Shit magnet, huh? Shit yeah, magnet. Shit. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, of course, as we've talked about in a group before, um, there's no lazy officers uh, dealing with PTSD. No, I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, <laughs> right. all, all my uh, all the fellow officers that I know that are suffering and dealing, and even the, my friends that are firefighters and and uh, EMTs, they they just they worked and they were hard workers. Right. And uh, I think that sort of is a part of the formula that puts you in harm's way. Um, so let's go to these eleven. But so what what got you? To, I mean, clearly it was eleven critical incidents at to say the least but what was what was it that got you directed to the psychologist at that time well surprisingly enough uh, it wasn't a street incident that uh, broke the straw that broke the camel's back it was um it was a fellow officer who uh, was very well respected within our department um uh, by everybody and she was uh, i was working in the youth office at the time uh doing a, a like a youth detective's job and I had a partner, and, and this, this officer who I'd known throughout her career, uh, she was a little junior to me, and uh, she was working a, a similar type job in the community. And like I said, loved by management, street officers alike, uh, the politicians in the city loved her. She was just all around, and she got diagnosed with cancer. Mm. And uh, I sort of stayed in contact with her as things progressed for her with that, and it progressed very fast. And um, she didn't have any family in the city, and I was uh, sort of her go-to because she was fighting the cancer. And God bless her, she was still doing some work at home and uh, trying to keep herself positive. And right. So I had contact with her that I wouldn't normally have with her, and uh, you know, it just it didn't get good, and it, it, she failed very uh, quickly. Mm-hmm. And after she uh, got to the point where she was hospitalized and passed away. And I was with her when she passed away and her family had come into town. Um, the, uh, you know, she, she passed away and our chief at the time, uh, authorized her to have as close to a police funeral as you could have for not, right you on. know, uh, dying in the line of duty and, uh, which was great. And I helped with that, helped organize that. And I was part of all of that. And uh, one of the things that I can reflect back on now is uh, I never shed a tear. Not once did I shed a tear. I did my due diligence. I did my duty. Did your own duty, right? Right. And uh, I put this all together. And uh, when it was over, um, her family went back. You know, one part of her family lived in Calgary. Another part of her family lived in Texas. And so they had all kind of gone back. And uh, I got back to work. And it wasn't too long, uh, uh, several weeks, a month later, that my partner started to notice a real change in my behavior, and I was oblivious. Um, I was one of those guys that came into work uh, early, you know, and worked late, and uh, never missed a meeting, never missed a court date, uh, was always on, was always on, you know. And uh, suddenly, I start strolling into the office at 9 o'clock in the morning, no phone calls, no heads up for my partner, so she's now covering for me. Um, I started missing meetings. I I was getting up and leaving and going home at 2 in the afternoon, not telling anybody, just didn't want to be there anymore. Mm. And then finally, uh, uh, 
Jackie, uh, God bless her, uh, she's a sweetheart. Her husband is on the job, and he's a bigger guy than me. <laughs> and uh, she just took me by the face one day, and she said, uh, something's wrong, you're not you. And I knew then that I just broke down. And so that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. And uh, I booked off, and there was nobody to guide me. There was nobody that I just booked off with, quote, unquote, stress. And I went and seen my GP, and I had a really good uh, doctor, and he referred me uh, to a good psychologist. Booked and off, you mean vacation? Book, sick no, time? I booked off on sick time. Okay. And, uh, of course, I was fortunate because I had all my sick bank because, like so many of us, we, uh, we – oh, is it time? <laughs> We're getting him to catch his breath. Hang on. Oh. <clears throat> I, uh, I had all my sick time to use, you know, got accumulated. Oh, yeah. So um, it was during that uh, time that I got to see the psychiat- a psychiatrist, sorry, I stand corrected, and the psychiatrist um, saw me a couple of times a week for a few weeks. And it was after a few weeks that he uh, sat me down and said, okay, this is what I think is going on. You are uh, suffering from severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Because during my times and my sessions with him, Everything that had ever happened that was horrific was just pouring out of me. Like I was crying all the time. I was uh, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't leaving the house. I was angry. I wanted to beat every person up that crossed me the wrong way, and most of them weren't. You know, I what do they call that? That dysregulated emotions, right? Everything was extreme. Yeah, just out of whack. Now, how long did you have on at this time? Uh, well, that was about uh, well, two thousand and one. I started in 85. You do the math, Manny. Uh, I'm not here for math, though. <laughs> 16. <laughs> 16 years. Yeah, I'm not here for math. 16, 17 years. <laughs> She's the numbers lady. She's the numbers right. lady. Look at Julie. Loving yeah. it. <laughs> well, when, and, and what I found, I, I find interesting and I often share is that when that doctor told me that I had PTSD, well, I just lost my shit. Well, you got mad? Like, right. I got mad. How I was, dare you? I was screaming and hollering at him, and I'm you know, banging on his desk, and I said, don't you repeat that outside this room. Exactly. I'll, I'll sue you, yeah. and the whole bit. And he what was, was your he, fear? He was a good guy, and uh, he leans back in his chair, you know, pencil in his mouth, <clears> and um, i kind of like, what are you smirking about? And he says, I'm just watching you prove my diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The fear is uh, it's a career killer. Yes, it is. Right? Um, yes, it is. You know, you got... You get diagnosed with PTSD and pointing out that at this point in my career and at this point in policing in Ontario, this wasn't something that was being taken care of or being talked about. Right. I know that there were, we all know that there was lots of officers from the beginning of policing that have yeah. dealt with PTSD. Right. <clears throat> this wasn't a topic of conversation. But well, we didn't invent this. Right. You're not a small dude, man. Right. Right. I mean, there's, there's certain things about guys and... I'm not speaking below women in law enforcement, but for us, man, if you're the biggest dude, you're the guy going in first anyways. And so we have this, even guys, right? I want I want Michael here, man, because if we got to go to blows, you know, and then all of a sudden now Michael can't do it. Yeah. You know, in our minds, we create this uh, false stigma of weakness. Yep. Right? And with his guidance, and uh, I settled down, of course, I went to my department, <clears throat> and what I learned was only for the second time somebody in my department had filed the paperwork for PTSD. Wow. And at that particular time in Ontario, there wasn't the protection that they have today with presumptive legislation uh, in regards to PTSD. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of flying with one wing there because I there was no guidance and there was no one in human resources that was going to step up and say, we'll do this for you and we'll do this for you. <clears throat> I'm still using up my sick time. And uh, when I filed, it went to workman's comp. And, of course, they turned me down. Fuckers, man. Even right. in another country, they're out to screw you. It's an insurance down. company, man. Fuckers. Of course, they're out to screw you. And uh, so my union uh, hired a uh, legal assistance, and uh, we were very fortunate to have a company outside of Toronto and the gentleman that ran the company and uh, his partner, they used to work for Workman's Comp. Nice. And they were now working at, at the other side of it, and they were working with the Toronto Police Service. And they worked with me, and they filed all the right paperwork, and we had a another hearing. 
for workman's comp and we put forward with his help we put forward the case in more detail and they turned me down again so not to cut you off real quick but i just want to touch on something um you said this was only the, you were the second person but we don't believe you were the only two in the whole department that ever had ptsd correct no the the second person to ever file the paperwork with workman's comp WSAB. So now, had you had you heard about anything with in your 16 years at that point? Other officers leaving and not doing good, maybe boozers or you know what was what was kind of the uh, you know because coming up in my department, you know you uh, that guy just drinks a lot, you know he just drinks a lot. Oh, he's always bitter. Yeah. You know that guy's just an asshole to begin with. Uh, looking back, I realized it wasn't. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And so is that something that happened to you as you look back there? You were like, hey, th- this motherfucker probably has what I have. Oh, absolutely. Hindsight's twenty twenty. when it comes to, uh, you know, looking back at some of my coworkers and some of the people that were part of my uh, shift, the senior guys that I yeah. respected and looked yeah. up to and how hard life was on them and how hard they were on life. And did a lot of those guys finish their career? Did they just quit or what? Uh, you know, them? varying degrees, you know, sure. guys that never yeah. seen two years of their retirement and then they passed or oh, that, that five um, year mark remember? you yeah. know we, I, i'm telling you you're you're pioneering stuff up there in canada and um your your diagnosis was like three years before mine and i know how archaic the medical system was even their treatment of us and it, it, that that many years ago 15 years ago 18 years ago for you now so did you um that must have been breaking out leeches to try to treat you so just um <laughs> Just for the 11, were any of those 11 uh, a shooting, officer-involved shooting? No. Take anyone's life? No, I never took anybody's life in the line of duty. Okay, so uh, this is just the, the the truest statement of cumulative totality of every part of that job that ate you up inside. Right? I uh, was uh, I attended uh, first officer on the scene um, at uh, some horrific homicides, uh, suicides, um, child deaths, right. you know, accidental uh, child death. Um, very early in my career, and uh, it just sort of seemed to continue. And um, it, uh, you know, some of these things, uh, they just they just don't leave me. They won't leave me alone. Right. And, uh, you know, as we've discussed before, you know, just, just having this conversation now, I've got all kinds of thoughts and, and issues that are coming into my head, things that are, I can't, you know, ever stop thinking about. And... Uh, Maybe now with time and, and treatment that, uh, you know, I'm able to sort of wide, ride the wave out a little bit more uh, today. But uh, for a long, long time after this, um, after two, in 2001, when I, you know, I say the straw that broke the camel's back, my friend passing away, and this stuff just come pouring out of me. And uh, um, nightmares started and stay with me even till today. Um, but again... Time and treatment, you know, frequency minimizes. And that. Yeah, that, that uh, intensity, duration, and frequency ch- yeah. is smaller and smaller. Yeah. So let's go back to that 2001 time where you're now being denied what's owed to you. Right. Um, how do you move forward from there? Well, I, uh, of course, the uh, legal uh, never uh, gave up, and uh, we had one more kick at the cat, and... Um, it's actually a funny story because it's Canada and this might not seem like a big deal here in, in the U.S., but, uh, you know, we're, we're, our culture is a little different in regards to firearms. And uh, I had a court appearance uh, and I attended court the morning of and the, the hearing, the third hearing. Your own hearing. My own hearing was later on after lunch at one of the local hotels. They had set aside a conference room. Right? So I met my lawyer there. Not even thinking, because when I went to the station and got my notebooks and my evidence and stuff, I put my gun on, you know, and I went to court. Never <laughs> give it much of a thought. <laughs> well, I showed up at the, the tribunal hearing and I sat down. But before I sat down, I took my jacket off and I've got a gun on my hip and uh, never give it a thought. And they rule in your favor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Anything way. this guy wants. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The, uh, the circumstance at the time was, uh, you know, there was no ruling while I was sitting in the room, but, you know, they heard new evidence and it was brought forward to them. And then we also had petitioned them that we were going to, we have a civilian review board that 
overseas workman's comp. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so, good. you know, when they, uh, interesting. if you feel that you're being uh, unduly treated by workman's comp and your case is such, you can put it forward to them. Nice. And, uh, like and they it. will they will look at it and then they will decide. So that was uh, that sitting was uh, supposed to be to get you know to give them the information that this is what's going to happen. So that meeting adjourned and uh, I went back to the station and I was in the station and I hear my name paged and I I go up I get paged to go to the deputy chief's office, well, which that's was, not a good thing. Yeah, that's and well, this thing. deputy chief I had a lot of respect for him and. He uh, he called me in the office and uh, he says, close the door. And I said, he goes, were you just at a WSIB hearing? I said, yeah. And he goes, were you wearing a gun? And I Absolutely. Said, I went, yeah, I was Why wearing a gun. I be? <laughs> well, he took a little chuckle out of that and he goes, please don't do that again. <laughs> he says, I got a phone call. <laughs> he says, I don't have to explain that again. I said, no problem, chief. Um, that progressed very quickly to this review board, this civilian review board. You talk about being vindicated. I walked into that meeting, just like all the other meetings, you know, hotel, conference room. It's all set up, but now we got these new people, these three new people. And this lady was the top dog. And when I walked in, she introduced herself. She's the first person at this review, at any of these, that didn't call me Mr. Fleming. Oh, she called me Officer Fleming. Nice. And that was one of the things that used to annoy the hell out of me because the workman's comp, even the people in my HR that were there, they called me Mr. Fleming. Yeah. And, you know, that's like a slap, right? Yeah, and, Mr. Fleming wasn't there. Officer Fleming was the one with the problem. Right. That's who you're bringing. No, let me ask you a question, though. At the time, because I can understand the, the importance of that, but... Is it really that much of a disrespect if they call you Mr. versus officer? Uh, at the time, it felt like a purposeful. Slap in the face, right? It, like it, they were doing it on purpose. It felt like a purposeful right. disrespect. And uh, and this this lady from this uh, civilian review, she uh, she referred to me as Officer Fleming. How are you today? And, uh, you know, I'm okay. And she goes, well, she says, I just want you to sit down and relax. And she says, and if I have any questions for you, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. I'm not ignoring you, but I've got some other things that need to be covered. And I went, oh, okay, thank you. And I looked over at the lo my lawyer. My lawyer goes, <laughs> well, she turned to them, and you know the terminology about having your a new asshole oh, ripped. Yeah. She she ripped the WSAB and my human resources, and and basically said to them, you you guys have now mm -hmm. over this is we're talking um, seven months later, eight months later, and uh, she says you've taken an officer who is dealing with PTSD, you have 11 documented incidents, any one of which falls within the legislation, but you have 11, and yet you turn them down, not once, not twice, but you planned on turning them down a third time. And you've now taken an officer with this PTSD and, and turned an officer into chronic right. PTSD. Right, the betrayal. And things were not good for me at that time. and. Uh, so, as I often joked after that, I got the gold card. I got the WSAB, the Workman's Comp gold card. And um, I can't say enough about the way my department treated me in this regard. Our, our service was, um, is divided in administration and operations. Mm. The operations is a side where the chiefs and the deputies and mm -hmm. all of us down in uniform, right. they treated me fantastic. Right. My chiefs that I had a couple of chiefs during this period of time where I was trying to get back to work and they always wanted to find meaningful work for me. They always accommodated me trying to get me back to work because I wanted to go back to work. Yeah. Human resources side, not so much. Right. The head of human resources can't say on even on this podcast what I think of her. But sure you can. No, we don't even broadcast in Canada, so you're good. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'll, I'll listen. I'll listen to that my. Don't get YouTube that far north. No, fuck no. <laughs> Not that listen, far north. I'll listen to my grandma. If you haven't got nothing nice to say, don't say anything. <laughs> um, you know, it it was uh, one of the things that was a saving grace for me, because as you asked the question about what you know what transpired after this, once it was settled and I got accepted and I got a claim number, that magic claim number, that's what we look for. Right. So now I have coverage if I want to go see a psychologist five times a week, if I want to, you know, if I need anything, medications that aren't covered, but I'm pretty lucky in that regard. But anything like that, I'm, I'm protected. 
So now I'm in a process of trying to get back to work. With uh, I've moved on from the psychiatrist, and I'm now seeing a psychologist. So at any time, knowing how fucked up you are, even then you still wanted to get back to that cruiser. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, that was me, yeah. dude. Yeah, same way, Mark. Uh, yeah, I wanted I wanted a clearance, and then every time a doctor told me. I had PTSD. I say I will never be in this office again. I'm going to another office. <laughs> just to right, get back in else. that cruiser. You yeah. just want in that cruiser. All I needed was a clearance so I could go back yeah. to my job. Never mind our mental health. Eh. We're going to go do our I've job. I've already abandoned that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it for 10 years. Fuck. Wow. Now, <laughs> real quick, let's touch on that. So here in the States, we, we can do 20 and, and retire. We can do 20 and drop. Um, or we can keep going until we die on the fucking road. How long before you can retire in Canada, honorably? Well, the norm. I mean, you can retire anytime you want, and your pension is, you know, Just as at such. that rate, whatever. At whatever the pension uh, rate is at the time. But mm -hmm. for the most part, anywhere from 30 to 32 years. Holy 30, fuck. 32 years, you max out your pension. Oh. So, you know, your years of service and uh, your, age, your age. And, uh, you know, and you max out your pension. And uh, so then. Anything you do after 32 years, you know, you're not really adding. It's to, pointless. Yeah. But 32 years is a long fucking time, bro. Mm -hmm. But that's that's typical. 32 though. years. It's crazy, man. How the fuck you do 32 we couldn't, years? You wouldn't, you wouldn't survive 32 years on these streets. Well, I don't know if they're surviving in Canada <laughs> 32 years. I mean, if they're not. I mean, physically, you'd be shot yeah. down in 32 years yeah. out there. I mean, that's uh, you're, you're, the odds are not in your favor at, yeah. at 20. Uh, yeah. We have guys that make 20 and they're like, fuck, I'm out. I didn't get shot. Yeah. I didn't kill anybody. I'm out. Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, a lot of the officers that I know up in Canada, their PTSD symptoms started to really show in the 17th, 18th, oh, 19th, 20th, yeah. 21. You know, that's uh, that's pretty common. And, you know, that's when you're at a point. It also sort of coincides with the age because mm. I think, uh, you know, statistically men in the, and women in their 40s, maybe early 50s, that's when some – mental health things might start, you know, you start looking at life a little bit differently. Right. And so you end it. up, you end up going back to the cruiser for 10 more years. Well, I was accommodated for that 10 year period. I wasn't always back to a cruiser. The ultimate goal was to get back to a cruiser. Good. Hold on. <clears throat> this is Julie's still here. Here comes the accountant. Yeah. yeah. No, no, She's no, going to correct I everybody. Just, <laughs> I just remember you telling me that um, your doctor said you couldn't do any 911 calls mm -hmm. um, yeah. back when after you were diagnosed. Wait, 911 calls? Like hot calls? Yeah. Like I, I never went back on a patrol squad. Okay. So uh, what ended up happening, um, you know, we, uh, we had a fairly, we fairly consistently have had foot patrol up in my city as long as there's been officers and we've never put we've never done away with that foot patrol in snow well it's gotta be fucking miserable <laughs> <You get> snowshoes <laughs> here's your snow hey, michael <laughs> it's negative 30 go hit the fucking beat <laughs> well, 12 you know, miles there, there is uphill a, both ways <laughs> yeah. there is a saying right a good officer never gets lonely hunger you're cold yeah that's <laughs> so, true yeah so, so you you go back in in a in various various jobs i i had uh, i was given uh, some jobs where i um for example, uh, the chief wanted an officer to purge some historical homicide files that have been, you know, they taken up, you know, how much, how many boxes and boxes right. and boxes. So that was one of the jobs they wanted me to do. And I did that for a while. So was the goal in doing that, keeping you long enough to get to that stage where I could to retire? So and giving you light duty. Either, okay. yeah, light duty, right. uh, accommodated. Um, the goal for me was to again work towards that right. pension but also i always had my eye on the prize to get back to doing full duty so what was the closest you got back to that goal um, foot patrol well the foot patrol um now the foot patrol officers uh, you know you know the idea is that you know we're not going to give officer fleming any 911 calls but you know that you put on the yeah, you, you put on see the uniform. It. it breaks out in front of you. It goes right you out walk front into of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're a fucking shit man. Yeah. Yeah. It finds you. Yeah, and so that you know that was something that I ended up having to deal with, and and of course there was a lot of relapses, and this is something that I sometimes am cautious with people that are fighting to go back to work is because the relapses hit you pretty damn hard. Yeah. Because you start feeling, and my psychologist who I have I haven't spoken to of him yet, but a very experienced. 
um, psychologist with a lot of his own personal history in the military. Um, he was that guy where any one of us would know right away, I like this guy. He gets me. He understands PTSD. So he often used to say to me, I worry about you the most when you're doing really well. When you're feeling good, I worry about you. Yeah, because you get cute. You, you start, think you're healed. You start reaching for the stars. Yeah. So now all of a sudden, I, I don't want to just walk the beat. I want to be in a car. I want to start responding. I want to be in a unit. And then you're going to overcommit to what you think you can do because you're out of high. Right. So and is that what happens in that 10-year period? On and off multiple times. Um, not only that, several serious incidents. Um, and, and as it turned out, and, and PTSD played a huge role in a few of these incidents, and I got into some violent circumstances that uh, were created by uh, a Michael who uh, was broken, who was broken, uh, had lost all his sense of tactical communication, lost all sense of, uh, you know, emotional uh, response to things. And uh, it's not a good place to be when you're walking around with a badge and a gun and, and dealing with the general public. And mm. subsequently, I ended up in uh, uh, some circumstances that led to the actual demise of my career. And uh, so when I, like I say, when I hear of officers that are fighting to get back on the street, um, I'm very fortunate it could have went sideways. Uh, right. You know, these incidents, uh, I'm the one that got hurt. I'm the one that got damaged. Can't imagine if it went the other way. And did I you did get disciplined in that time no. period of any of those things? No. Yeah. We no. run into a lot of officers that have that. They come to us because, hey, uh, you know, the backstory story is... Um, is the PTSD, but they come because they just got in some disciplinary problems. Right. But it's it's because they're broken. They're responding to these things, and they're fractured when they arrive on scene. Well, every everything is a threat. Yeah. We're hypervigilant. We're angry. Yes, sir. We don't know what our emotion is. We might be sad while we're walking that beat or driving right. that cruiser, or we might be angry. And it just takes one idiot to look at us the wrong way, and it's fucking game on. I think right? it's probably just a matter of time, though, for Michael. You know, and there were many calls I got to have to go to the hospital emergency, you, you know. So it was, that was to your question. No, he didn't, but it, in, it was just a matter of time, and I'm sure. Coming. That, yeah, yeah, that's all of us. Yeah. So, wow. so let's go to the very last part of that, where that was it. Now, before we get to that real quick, at what point is Julie involved in any of this? Because I know we were bullshitting before the podcast about I made the mistake of saying that was your second wife. <laughs> Apparently, I was two times less than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, when Julie and I met, um, I had been, uh, it was during the vast, at the end of this 10 year. You were still working. I was still working. So before- I was actually in fugitive apprehension. Um, it was a circumstance that worked very well for me. I was very protected because uh, my supervisors in the intelligence section. Um, they uh, my partner was a confirmed sergeant so he took all responsibilities for everything so i was insulated i wasn't dealing with the general public per se most of the work that i did was you know investigative work and looking for a particular person where they are maybe knock on a few doors do a little bit of surveillance you know more times than not we had the assistance of other departments who would pick up someone in uh, you know in halifax or pick up someone in bc and we would just begin on a plane to go and retrieve them. So it was kind of a, I was kind of protected in that job. And that was during that period of time is when I met Julie. But before that, you were married. I was married for 17 years. So would you say that the demise of that marriage was a result of the PTSD and the, and the trauma of, and the job itself? Yeah, I would say it was a big part of it. Were you a boozer? Like, uh, well, did you have bad habits, vices? Um, no, with uh, I, in 1995, uh, when I was with my my wife at the time, was uh, I ended up going into rehab for alcohol and prescription drug dependency. So that changed. Uh, I you know we were together from 1990, 95, and you know again hindsight talking about PTSD in hindsight. I can look back at what was going on in my life at the time. Nobody ever diagnosed it as PTSD, right. but uh, it doesn't, you know, take a rocket science to uh, to look, rocket scientist to look at see what was going on in my life and the increase in the alcohol consumption and the attitude and the change in that. 
But when I, I went to rehab hospital and I come out of that and I sort of took a different uh, direction in life and a bit of a healthier direction in life. And what I think that did is that helped me have a little bit more longevity mm-hmm. before the, you know, the, the circumstance where the wheels fell right off the bus. Right. So, um, so there, yeah, there were some troubles uh, in the marriage in the, in the sense of having to deal with me and my drinking and how I was during that time. And I can reflect back that it had to do a lot with the job. I mean, there were other factors. It's never always about PTSD. Right. You know, there was some personality things that changed over time. And sometimes when one is getting healthier and the other one, you know, my ex probably hate, hates to hear this. She hated to hear it when she was told it by my psychologist, but she was an enabler. And uh, uh, one of us dealing with PTSD, the last thing that we need is a wife who is a complete enabler. And because that will lead you down a path that will not help you get better. Right. And uh, so I managed to find someone who's absolutely not an enabler. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> so uh, real quick, just to touch on that, on the boozing and the drugs. Do you, what, I know the reason, but just for the listeners and the followers, what were you trying to drown out? What, what was the purpose of, of drinking to excess and in, in, in the medication? I think at the time I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer at the time. Um, at now, I just look back, I reflect back at some of the things that stay with me, that that still bring me to tears. That happened during that period of time, from eighty-five to ninety-five, in the first ten years of my career. Um, some of these circumstances that I just, you know, I know every single detail, and it just won't, you know, won't haunts leave me you. alone at time and haunts me. Well. Back then, I was still flying, right? I was still uh, full throttle, you know, you know, drink hard, play hard, work hard, go, 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 go. So anything that anything that might have been haunting me that I was trying to drown out or drug out or it wasn't sort of in the forefront. It just was, you know, it was one of the cool things that I did on the job, right? Because that's what we do, right? Just move on and go on to the next one. And uh so the the circumstance was that uh, you had to uh, you have to look back now and say okay maybe this is the wise, but that was then and this is now because uh, you know everything's has to take its own its turn right yeah it's been a long long road and ups and downs and roller coasters and as I was referring to when I met Julie I was in a really good place when I met Julie I had a great doctor I was on. I was doing well. I had sort of some stability. I was on a good job that I was proud of. I had gotten my pride back as far as being, you know, confidence, confidence. And I was doing really well and uh, well enough that I was able to trick her that I wasn't crazy. <laughs> How'd that work out, Julie? You figured it out, didn't you? <laughs> you didn't hide Pretty that quick. shit very well. <laughs> so let me ask Julie, because she sat there nice and quiet. Um, you, you've got... For the three of us, you know, you you got a lemon, you got a broken you got a broken wheel here, right? Um, he was coming coming to you at what seventeen years by now of of police and trauma, and what 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 was your um, well, when I, job? What were you uh or I guess how do you guys meet? Oh, that's a long story, but <laughs> <laughs> we 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 met, yeah, but. That's a whole different. Okay, so you guys topic. met. Yeah. So we met anyhow. Um, to. Right, we met during an investigation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Julie Basically, w- someone he was looking for was a patient of mine. So. Okay. That sums it up. Fair enough. So as long as we you met. weren't the person he was looking no, for, right? It's all right. No, no, no. <laughs> um, actually, when I met Michael, he was very open about his PTSD, and I knew nothing about it, and. I had seen people with depression and... Um, what was your job? I, I was part owner of a pharmacy. Okay, because mm-hmm. you said you had a patient. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So I didn't know if it was a mental health no, uh, no. field you were in or not. It, the medis- no, she wasn't pharmacy. my doctor. No, no. <laughs> no. He's trying. It would be like you to pick up on the nurse in the office. Yeah. <laughs> I can see it already. <laughs> yeah, he's a little flirtatious. <laughs> Um, so I knew nothing about PTSD, but one of the things I did do was I, I started to educate myself and ask questions and Michael took me to his doctor and, and, um, you know, there was, 
I guess it's my personality, my life experience, my age, my confidence, that how I handled it actually, I think, is a big part of the teamwork we do in his in his day to day life. Mm. Uh, Michael also, <clears throat> I think, one of the one of the benefits of meeting him when I did was that Michael had already been through so much therapy and mm. already sort of got a handle on what he was dealing with and learning how to deal with PTSD. Um, and he continues to this day, but it wasn't fresh. It wasn't new. You know, I meet a lot of young couples and. And you know the the guy or the girl has just been diagnosed, and they're at a place it's it's heartbreaking, right? Where I didn't have to go through that, so that I think really helped our situation. Plus the uh, amount of effort I put into to learning about it, and Michael and I have really good communication skills, right? So we talked a lot about it, and he's right. I don't enable him. I don't put up with any crap. He always says PTSD isn't um, an excuse or a reason to be an asshole. Mm. And I hold him accountable. And I think it, it helps him as well. So it helps our relationship. Yeah, those are hard years, those initial diagnosis years. Yeah. And I know you know that. And it's really hard on a spouse. And, um, you know, I'm not on my first marriage either. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I lost a relationship, you know, my last marriage because of that too. And so now... Uh, what what kind of therapy did you get with the, with the psychologist? What were you what were you doing? Was it uh, talk therapy, cognitive, EMDR? Um, most of it was talk therapy. Okay, and uh, we uh, I didn't really there wasn't really a lot of you know the stuff. That, what would you just call EMDR? It? EMDR. Right. That wasn't readily available uh, at the time. wasn't something that was offered and. He was very skilled at what he did. Uh, like I said, he had a lot of experience in uh, his own personal life. And, uh, and as a psychologist, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> he had a lot of first responder and military clients. So he had, he had really, uh, I got to try some water here. That coffee's not cutting it. Yeah. So, so Julie, let me ask you, um, you, you said he's in a better place when you meet him. What experiences did you have? Uh, as you're dating, did you see any, did you see, let me ask you, did, did you see anything that said, you know, fuck this, I, I'm fucking out of here. Like, I'm not signing up for this shit. Yeah, what scared you uh, initially? Yeah. Or if anything did blush. scare you. Right. Um, I did, Michael did have a relapse um, while he was still working. Uh, there was an incident and uh, he was badly hurt. And I think it was after that that I started to see a, a quick decline um it was tough it was tough what what advice if any would you give to a spouse who's just coming into um ptsd i know he, he you say you know he he had already been through the worst part which i don't necessarily agree with you because you still have to see the the residual of that mm -hmm. but these spouses that are coming up and their their husbands are changing to what michael was mm -hmm. you know um, the tenacity and the willingness to learn about it rather than just say, you know, suck it up and let's move forward. Any advice? Like what, what did you, what did you, I what did your mindset change that when you said, oh, I'm going to learn about this when he relapsed? I guess, um, obviously I was scared. I didn't, I didn't understand it enough, but I wanted to learn and I asked a lot of questions, but I also had a strong believing that I'm human, I have feelings, we're in a relationship, and and we have to work as a team on this. And, and I absolutely refuse to walk on eggshells. Um, I'd been through that before in a previous marriage, and I was not gonna live through that again. So I think, once again, with my life experiences, it put me in a different mindset than, say, somebody who's 30 years old, has children at home, their husband's been on the job five years, and you know, it's a whole different dynamic. Um, I think there's a whole, there's a saying that I live by now, I wish I knew them what I know now. And I think if the younger generation can really absorb that um, and learn from that, it's gonna be helpful. But I think it's really a personality and, and a team effort as, as spouses. Um, Michael was, 
I made it very well known to Michael that, listen, if this is going to work, I'm not going to tolerate uh, any sort of abuse, any sort of uh, disrespect. Um, and that's not who Michael is. And that was one of the things that kept me going was that Michael's a good person. He didn't think he was a good person, but I knew he was a good person. You, and mentioned, you mentioned eggshells. Yep. What were some of those triggers or eggshells that would set him off that would have something that you, the two of you would have to cope with? So if I ever, and even to this day, it's I still will speak my mind. And if there's things that I say to Michael that make him feel ashamed or him feel bad or um that's on him that's not on me like that's not her that wasn't her intent right and mm. one of the things that we had a lot of discussion over and actually our counseling helped was i would ask michael a question and he would take it as i was criticizing him and absolutely that, right absolutely but it was <laughs> i totally relate yeah. to that yeah, the fucking, three psychos in yeah. this room yeah. it's like yeah what's wrong yeah. with you what's wrong? why would you attack him how like dare that? you tell me to throw out the garbage like that <laughs> yeah. what? Why do you gotta so yell i don't at me? know how to manage a house yeah right. is that what you're telling me <laughs> and and i would we we actually came up with this you know um kind of a joke now but i would look at him and say babe it's just a question and he had to learn to get his head around the fact that that's all it simply is, is a question. It's not an attack on your skill. It's not an attack on your character. It's just a question. And it took Michael time, but he got it. And mm. But even to this day, there's still times that I'll say something and it exasperates him or it causes him some stress. And I've just, I have, I just learned very early that that's... I can't take that on. I can't take that on because that's not healthy. She's not responsible. It's not your responsibility no. because we're stupid in our head. It's broken. And because you said, you know, why did you pick that color over this color? And we Boy, that's a good, healthy boundary. Shape, that's a good, healthy boundary that you well, we have to because one of, the, one of the common things that happens with me, and I have heard enough of uh, the different couples talking about it at group, is the fact that we are so sensitive. We are so self-centered where everything is about us and, you know, everything's an attack on us. And, of course, we don't like us, so why would anybody else like us? And right. so what I can, if I had to give advice, and I don't like to give advice, but if I had to give advice is you have to find a way with your spouse to totally trust her. So even if she's saying something that's a little to you is, is, is rubbing you the wrong way, mm. you have to be able to say you need to trust her. You might not like it. You know, it's that, I mean, we just spent an entire career doing that. Right. Come on, how many commanders did you work for that you absolutely did not like? But when they told you to do something, you did it. Right. Because they were the commander. Yes. And so, so that's what Julia is. She's, she's chain the of commander. Command. She's the highest it's, chain of commander. And, Shit rolls downhill. Michael. Well, I'm going to tell you, with my brain and the way it goes on <laughs> fire sometimes, I am very fortunate to have somebody that has things ducks in a row. Yeah. You so know, for you, Julie, when... Um, it, clearly, you had to establish these boundaries before you were married, correct? Correct. So correct. Um, for a spouse out there who's already been married and is now exhibiting this, it would have been very easy for you to give up. Like, just be like, fuck this. I don't need this dude. Like, I don't need his problems. I don't need the drama. What? I, and I know it was love, and I know Mike, I love him to death. But what about for you was it that said, you know, I'm not just going to give up on this dude? Well, for Mike, in our particular situation, is it's because of who Michael is. I mean, he always treated me well. He adores me. <laughs> I do. And uh, you know, so I knew he was a good person. I knew that it was a health. It was going to be a healthy relationship. And no relationship's perfect. We have PTSD. We deal with. So we deal with it, and we deal with it together. And uh, I think that's really, really helped. Michael and it's helped our relationship um, I didn't I never wanted to walk away there's days I want to walk away for a few hours and I do and <laughs> rightfully so you know I'll, I'll just honey I'm going out and you're not coming with me <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then I come back and I feel great you know I just there's days it's exhausting and but I never got to the point with Michael where I thought there's no future I don't I don't see us together. I, I don't like this person. You know, I, I always knew that. And I always remind Michael, you're a good person. 
You know, you have to learn to love yourself because he's actually made me a better person. You know, I think there's parts of my character that needed to um, be revisited. And, and Michael really helped me see the better in a lot of situations and a lot of people. So I think it's just, it worked. Well said. Worked. And yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, we, we, to hear you're a better, you're, you're a good person for us is deep. Because we don't feel good. And hard pill to, for and us to choke down. That's a hard fucking pill to How swallow. How do you feel man. about that? Well, How much do you believe that? Oh, I believe it now. She's finally convinced me. Scale, took her, scale took her, of one to ten me. Uh, on on, on me ten. being a good person? Yeah. Oh, I'm a solid six. Ah, <laughs> six yeah. I mean, a six. A six. <laughs> so yeah. that that's actually probably a really honest answer. <laughs> Honestly, I know it <laughs> because is. I know it is. even, I'm even going to say six months ago, he was um, at four. He, no, he. We would we would be out, and he would make some comment, and it was you know something negative about himself or mm-hmm. sort of some dynamics in his life, and and I would look at him and I said, stop it, just stop it. You're so down on yourself. Stop it, and. I did that a couple times, and, and I I'd guess, feel worse because my wife yelled at yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so stupid. Ah, stupid. <laughs> You're right, honey. <laughs> but she's um, absolutely right. I need to she's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah he yeah. was always so down on himself, uh-huh. and and and, made, and then he would try to make it as a joke, right? It was sort of fluff it off as a joke, and right. And I just look at him and say, "There's no need for that." There just so I brought it to his attention, and he might have been aware of what he was doing, but not aware of how it was being portrayed, mm. right? So I would bring that to his attention. At the end of the day, all I can do is tell him how how it appears or what he's saying, how it comes across. It's up to him what he does with that information. Mm. And w- one of the things that comes out of that when you're in circumstance that we're talking about is I will make a comment about myself or my circumstance or my life that uh, makes me look like less than. And part of the reason I think that happens to us and it happens to me is that I haven't had this conversation enough with the right people. I haven't talked about it enough through. I haven't, instead of just making these quips and comments, and sometimes in a circumstance where really I shouldn't be telling these people that, I should be saying to her, this is how I'm feeling. Right. Now, mm-hmm. I, I know that we all, you know, we all like express yourself, communication, express yourself. <clears throat> but if you don't, let some of that stuff out as just regular conversation. Like I can't get this off my mind or I got, then you're going to come up and we love humor, right? We love humor, a lot of dark humor in our careers. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And so we can fluff everything off as funny, but uh, you know what? At the end of the day, you talk down about yourself, you're going to be down about yourself. So what are you looking at me for? He said at the end of the day. Oh, <laughs> Mark hates he owes, that term. He owes me $20 every time it's on the broad podcast. But you won't hear me say it much. He <laughs> fucking hates that term. So um, that uh, clearly you guys live happily ever after. You, you've got it figured out, Julie. And we'll, we will have you back on the Spouses podcast for sure because – you and group is awesome. Thank you. Because you're re- you keep us all in check. Like Mike gets yelled at, I'm like I'm not saying a fucking word. <laughs> that was the bad thing to say. Julie got mad at me. Uh, so let me ask you a question. During that, during the 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 fucking hells and pitfalls of of your worst, were you suicidal at all? Yeah. 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 Did you yeah. attempt it? No. So no. you just had those those thoughts of I would uh, entertain uh, the the nuances of why it's a good idea. And uh, if anyone ever takes the time to try and figure out why it's a good idea, if they take that avenue, they're probably not going to do it because it's not a good idea if you truly uh, – I, 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 I had this analogy once, and I don't know if it's going to work on the podcast. It works in my head. But I often look at the whole suicidal ideology as that, you know, that, that path that as you're, as you're going along in your life, good, bad, or indifferent, and you see this path – and you decide to start thinking about suicide and you get on this path. Well, as you walk along this path, the hedges are ankle height. And as you keep going, the hedges are knee height. And as you further go down, they're chest height. Now, you can still look over them. And there's times when I felt like I was looking over the hedges and I turned around and went back. Right. My mm-hmm. concern is and my fear is, is that if you keep going to the hedges are well over your head, it's going to be calm and it's going to be cool and it's going to be quiet and you're going to fall for it. You're, it it's, a, it's a trick. Yeah, Because you're going to think that's the answer because when you're behind those high hedges, 
you can't see your kids, you can't see your wife, you can't see the yeah, people, gone. you can't see the people that you're going to devastate. And when that, I started thinking about this many, many years ago, and I kind of come up with this analogy for myself. I started coining the phrase, it's not an option. Any time that I would entertain that, you know what? They'd be better off without me. They'd be better off. I, I just can't handle this anymore. I'd rather just make it stop. It's not an option. It's not a fucking option if you're Manny. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you have watched this podcast, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, I spent a lot of time with Manny. So. But, you know. Michael and I hang out. God bless you, brother. <laughs> but there it is, right? Got to make a joke at the end of something that we're talking about. Yeah. It's serious, right? But sure. it's not an option. And I... I you know, I'm not afraid to talk to anybody that's in our circumstance now if they're entertaining suicide. I will sit down with them and just thinking about killing yourself. Well, let's talk about not that. Today. Let's, let's see how that's going to go. I actually talked to one guy and said, you know what? You phone me for permission. Right. Right. So the next time you're thinking about it, phone me for permission and see how that goes. Yeah. Because if we don't put it right out there, it's it's not the boogeyman. It's a horrific way to solve, to not solve a problem. Right. Mm. You know, because it doesn't it solve anything. It creates more problems oh, than all it does. What, what it would do, I mean, I, I've, I've been, I don't like to say the word the victim, but I've been the person that suffered from suicide. Um, you know, family that uh, I love dearly and uh, did not see it coming. Right. Um, I've lost five coworkers to suicide. Mm. It, it just seeing what it does, the aftermath yeah. is, you know, everybody that, you know, that can hear my voice. It's not an option and you better find another way. I would rather live miserably than not live. Well, I, I saw a statistic and they said if a person commits suicide, their children are 50 percent more likely to commit suicide. So if you're thinking about suicide, you're killing your children. Yeah. yeah, literally yeah. Ch- killing your children. Yeah. So let that stop that bullet. Yeah, let's Absolutely. stop that plan. So when that's um, a great analogy, by the way, the that, hedge thing. Yeah, I've I've, I've shared that before, and, yeah. and and it 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 just it keeps me in check. Mm-hmm. Get off that damn path. Turn around. Get back with everybody yeah. else. Yeah. So um, how'd you find us? How'd you find Pistol? Uh, what brought you to us? I can explain that. Yeah. Oh, all right, Julie. It's a Julie connection. <laughs> Another connection. I uh, was on a board of directors where we uh, we lived back uh, Chandler. in Chandler, and um, I had to call police for an incident. And when I was talking to the officer, and it came up in conversation about uh, Michael and PTSD, and he was from Canada, and and uh, anyhow. Two days later, there's a knock at our door, and it's one of uh, Chandler's finest knocking at the door with some pamphlets for Pistol, and it said, uh, <laughs> "Rock on, yeah. spread awesome. the word, yeah. Pistol," yeah. and a couple of very yeah. cool challenge coins. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's Chandler, it doesn't miss. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, they don't so, have much to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so do you have do you have anything back home like Pistol? Um, right now, uh, just prior to coming down, um, Julie and I are snowbirds. For those that are listening, we come down at uh, the beginning of November and we go home at the end of April. And we don't like the snow and we don't like 120 degree heat. Smart. You're and here. S- here. Smart here. and smart. Yes. Yeah. And uh, up home, just prior to coming down, uh, with the help of uh, a couple of fantastic uh, brothers and sisters, we started a group called PTS Post Trauma Support. And they're affiliated with a program out of Perth, Ontario, Post Trauma Support. It's uh, similar to your West Coast uh, program. Yeah. It's mm. uh, intense six days, or, and uh, I was uh, I, I I attended that um, a couple of years ago, and a very intense six days. That was very extremely helpful. And I mean, I've I've been to a couple of trauma programs that were eight weeks long. Yeah. Um, mm. But this six days. Um, it stayed with me uh, very well. And uh, so part of post-trauma support is that they began these satellite meetings. So they, um, they encouraged us as, as fellow cohorts to go into our communities. And uh, so we now have one in Hamilton, uh, Ontario. There's one in London, Ontario, uh, Guelph, Ontario. Like they're, they're, there's, I think there's a couple out west now in Western Canada. So it's growing as the cohorts grow and members go out and, and people are able to. 
Um, I, I had a tough time. I wanted to get this started right away, but it's hard to start a group like PTS or Pistol when you're gone six months out of the year. Right. right. So very fortunate that uh, the the guys and girls that uh, sort of come together, um, they're the they're the crux of it all, and they got it going, and they're they're home now, keeping it going. And the big difference between our group and Pistol is ours is all first responders and military. So we've um, mm. You know, we're open to anyone dealing with the symptoms of PTSD. And culturally, you know, things are, are, are circumstances are uh, at home, uh, you know, a little different. You know, things are few and far between. So we got to, you know, take advantage of the circumstances. The, you know, we, uh, a friend of mine who's a pastor got us a room and in, uh, in the church and it's a nice big room. And, you know, it's, nice. it's a great location. And was nice. uh, I was able to attend uh, half a dozen or so meetings. Uh, prior to coming down. So I, I read the emails. I keep it, you know, try to keep up on things. That's awesome. So um, in closing, you and I have something in common, aside from just standard good looks. Yeah. We both have service dogs, yes. including Mark. So that he includes in, in, in the uh, service dog persona. So <laughs> what about the good looks? I don't, well, the good I don't looks come in there, too. <laughs> uh, Suck. <laughs> you've got Mina there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know when I got six... Uh, I was not happy. Like, I was not happy at all. I didn't want a dog following him around. I wasn't a, uh, an animal guy or a dog guy like Mark is. And um, what were your thoughts? Did you get Mina after you retired or were you still working? I was still working. No, you weren't. Oh, well, no. you were way off on that one. No, I mean, Julie, he, he said was retired. He, was he still working when he got Mina? I wasn't working. But he I wasn't, wasn't retired, but he wasn't. Working. working okay right so specifically yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what um what was your experience when you when you were working with her were you um he wasn't working with her at all and on the job you mean yeah no no i never worked with her on the so job so when you got her she uh, was already I, trained no so no. you trained her like i did with six right yeah well i we, can explain it to you go ahead okay so michael was uh told in 2011 that his career was over but he was still um part of he was was a member of the service until two years ago when he decided to retire Uh so after he was told he was no longer um able to go back to work we saw on the news one day that there was a, a a military person trying to board a plane with a service dog and for ptsd and they got refused well that hit oh wow that hit the news and I thought, oh, service dogs for PTSD. So I spent about six months looking into it and um, and he found a, found a breeder, did all the testing to make sure Mina had the aptitude. Her name's Mina the dog. And uh, we found a trainer. We did it personally. We paid for it out of pocket mm-hmm. um, because we knew we wanted a female. We knew we wanted a golden doodle because they're hypoallergenic. They don't yeah. shed. And it took about a year and a half of training. And the training was every day for a year and a half. And then once her training was done, um, she was qualified for North America. But in order to go to Europe and different parts of the world, she had to get accredited. So I made some phone calls. A lot of organizations wouldn't um, test her because they she wasn't their dog. Right. But we did find a wonderful organization in uh, Canada and um, in Ottawa. out of Ottawa, and they agreed. And Michael went up with her and uh, did the test, and they passed with flying colors. And yeah. so now every three years she has to be tested, right. and yeah. she's uh, it's it's been amazing uh, yeah. for Michael. So it's one really interesting story if if i can Go just ahead. proceed um when michael first got mina one of the the training was in a in a shopping mall sort of in and out of stores and yeah. and to make sure that she stayed focused on him and not all the people that you know would walk by and go oh your dog's so cute yeah <laughs> and um and michael saw a guy coming towards us who was a fellow officer and he i could see it on his face he was so embarrassed and almost tried to avoid this this guy and anyhow the guy saw him and said hey you know mikey and they started talking and 
afterwards, I, I said to Michael, you know, I asked him, I said, you looked really uncomfortable. He says, I was humiliated. You know, here I am. I, I have a service animal and, and this is some guy I worked with for all these years. And, and, uh, and anyway, so we talked through that and we talked through about, you know, what people think and really the people that love us that are part of our life is who you, you care about the people that are strangers. If they, they don't like it. Oh, well, it helps him. And that's all I care about is Mina helps Michael. Right. And uh, anyhow, about, we'll fast forward a couple years later, and Michael got a call from the police department that there was an award ceremony, and they wanted to give him a 30-year pin. And it meant putting his number one uniform on and going to an auditorium in front of hundreds and hundreds of colleagues and people from the department. And he went, and we went, and he took Mina and he got on the stage proud with Mina. Nice. And the whole place was clapping and Mina was like they she all stole just, the show. She stole yeah. the show. She and, always does. You know, yeah. And, yeah. and but to see that transformation from humiliation to proud. That's huge. That's huge. It's yeah, it's yeah. rough. Yeah. It, it Six is. and I had that love hate relationship for a couple of years. I didn't like going to the stores with her, you know, I just Yeah, I hated the attention. It was I just hated, hated now, the attention you know. and you know, I put her vest on her and yeah. Um, but she loves to work, yeah. you know, and I've seen firsthand, I've experienced it with her being able to sleep comfortably, being able to go out in places. Um, she's now for me, six is more at home, keeping me safe, not hyper vigilant and stuff. And I know Mina goes out with you everywhere. Um, but so with that being said, again, I appreciate you guys coming out. You're always welcome on this podcast. Julie, I definitely want you back for the Spouses podcast. Count me um, in. Michael, you're, well, you're welcome back anytime. Yes, pal. You want to come it. back. You come back anytime. <laughs> uh, if you guys have any questions or you want to leave comments for Michael or Julie or us, just leave a comment. Just be aware that the government in the United States will kick them out sometime in April. <laughs> <laughs> and they cannot return until November. Thank God. And we're building a wall. That's why we're north. building the wall because of these guys. <laughs> no, we're, we're saving. helping your economy. We don't, yeah, we don't need to build a wall. We'll just put up a wire up there. That's sense enough. Yeah, a, little, a little flag. Yeah, Trudeau will just <laughs> Trudeau. pout and he'll shake yeah. his fist a little bit. And <laughs> Can I just, on this note for PTSD, I mean, I one quick little, quick little story. So Michael and I are at a restaurant one day. We're in a, in in the vestibule waiting and it's getting crowded and so I went up to give our name and this lady comes up to me and she says can I ask what PTSD is because Michael has that on no, Mina's vest right. which, fair question not everybody knows what PTSD is so I said post-traumatic stress disorder I swear this is how she, what she did <gasps> your dog has PTSD <laughs> <laughs> yes. and Michael looked at me and he said <laughs> did she just and yeah. Julie's like, yeah, she yeah. just said yeah. it. And he walked out. Yeah. So. Yes, PTSD because yeah. of the handler. He, he, peed yeah. on the, he peed on an electric fence one day. Yeah. He's never been the same. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. again, I appreciate you guys coming out. You guys didn't have to drive all this way. Uh, please come back, both of you. Yeah. Uh, Love to. M Michael, come back. Have you know, Chop it up with us. Uh, Mina Six will have a play date. Uh, I appreciate you being so candid with us and being open. I know that was rough. Mark and I were watching you telling you to take drinks. Uh, we'll do it again. It gets easier. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I appreciate coming out to Pistol and spreading the word. And most of all, above anything, I appreciate what you're doing in Canada. You know, bringing that awareness and not not hiding behind the stigma and um, really just helping those people that, that, that have no idea or no light in what the hell they're getting into. So with that said, Mark, I know you're used to this. Michael and Julie, this is something we do at the end of it. To us... And those like us, you 11. guys come join us. Yeah, love and peace. Thanks for having us.